right, everyone, I think we'll get going. Um, hopefully you all can hear me pretty well and you're able to see the screen on the uh, my screen shared over the webinar. Um, my name is Jim Duncan. I'm the director for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative, and I'm excited to talk today a little bit about the uh, Northeastern Forest Health Atlas, which we've recently released. Um, if uh, you have any questions during the webinar, there is a Q&A section, so you can put your questions into that box, or you can type them in the chat window, and we will monitor those and make sure that they get answered at the end of the webinar. Um, so we'll be taking some time for questions at the end. And um, I, if there are any other mechanics, I'll be doing my best to monitor the chat as well, so please give me a shout if there's something wrong with the webinar as we're going through. Um, other than that, I think we're ready to get started, so I'll jump right in. And I'm just going to turn off my videos so we can focus on the pretty maps instead of my face. So the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas is a tool of the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. Um, it was developed in partnership with uh, the Northeastern States Research Cooperative and a number of other contributors. And we're really excited to share this, this product as a new offering for the community and a way to distribute uh, some data that's been hard to get to otherwise. I want to start off by thanking um, many of the folks who really contributed substantively to this project, uh, specifically the Northeastern States Research Cooperative uh, and the U.S. Forest Service for funding this work. Um, also from the participation of the uh, Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry and the FATET FAST team from the U.S. Forest Service, uh, New Hampshire Department of Natural uh, of uh, Natural and Cultural Resources, Kyle Lombard and Jennifer Weimer, uh, Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, Ken Gooch and Felicia Andre, and later Nicole Kelleher, as well as New York DEC, Jerry Carlson, Scott McDonald, and Maine Forest Service, Dave Strubel and Greg Miller, all were instrumental in not only giving us access to the historical data, but helping us understand it and work with it. So the Northeastern Forest Health Atlas, uh, many of you may have looked at the link already, is a way to access a lot of information. Uh, the key to it was providing a long-term record and archive of a key data set, which is aerial detection surveys. Uh, these are surveys that have been standardized by the US Forest Service in partnership with states since 1997. And the methods have largely been uh, consistent across the states, although there are differences in how that data has been collected. Um, but that data was being collected prior to 1997, and the methodologies could vary. In some cases, it goes back digitally until the 80s in Vermont, um, to the 60s in New Hampshire, to the 30s in Massachusetts, and even back to 1918. Over that time, obviously, it's not all been collected by flight, but there's been detect efforts to delineate areas of damage from uh, biotic and abiotic agents. So we're trying to provide a long-term record and archive of that resource that's been a bit scattered in the past and make that information easy to access um, and as well as uh, the data, but also information about that data. And we want to make it easy for users of this portal to quickly find the relevant information they're after and fill this gap in our region for making this data more accessible. Um, so going forward, uh, there's great collection protocols, but looking backwards, we think there's an opportunity to continue to expand backwards in time what we can uh, say about uh, patterns of disturbance in our forests. And we also wanted to try and bridge the gap between monitoring and research. So one thing that we sought to do with this portal is to uh, bring alongside the monitoring data, relevant research data that's been collected by researchers on forest disturbance. And that's where we were focusing or we're working with the NSRC is to target research that, that's been funded by NSRC, um, archive that data and make it available. In building the Forest Health Atlas, uh, we started in some cases with paper maps. Um, so actually getting paper out from underneath people's desks and putting it into a digital format so that we can include it in the archive. We also did a lot of code translation. Um, data often was collected and stored in yearly files. Um, sometimes those coding schemes changed over time. And we took uh, all the various standards and walked them forward to the uh, current ADS standard, IDS standard of codes that are used by the US Forest Service in the states today. So um, instead of someone having to do that work to start, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get that together. And then we also did some work on uh, some hotspot analysis and some um, general trends for the last uh, 
for the most recent period um, and developing tools that make it easy to rerun these hotspot analyses by anyone in the future. Um, and finally, uh, pulling together that past research information. So we reached out to principal investigators from the five state uh, area and sought out data that they have been collecting with field information and um, trying to get that data archived in the FEMC system. So the result is, uh, this is just kind of a little graphic to show you why, why you've been undertake this effort, right? So this is what we saw for disturbance in 2016. And um, we know that uh, if we add additional years, we can go back in time. Um, and this information as we walk back tells us more and more of a picture of what the patterns of disturbance have been. Uh, this is the kind of current, uh, more recent period of aerial detection survey data that's currently in the system showing areas that have been mapped in the last uh, 15 years somewhat in a standardized format. And this in and of itself is very interesting and informative to be able to have these pieces together. But when we look, oh, sorry, uh, when we look even further back, we start, um, we can gather more information. There's problems in that some years we start missing states. So you can see here as we go back to 1980s, um, there are some states that stopped reporting, specifically uh, New York has a lot of paper data, but not a lot of digital data. Um, going back to the 1970s and before, we see methods changes like uh, mapping general zones of disturbance in uh, Maine for spruce bubworm, but altogether, um, there's still usable data that's in there and it's standardized now and available to be accessed. Um, so this is information was collected at significant expense and we need to find a way to access that information because right now, um, what you're seeing on the screen aside from the incomplete sentence is a snapshot of what's currently available online from other portals. So we have a lot of information that could be out there, but right now we're really only able to get public access to just a couple of years of data. So enough of the PowerPoint, I wanna switch over to the website and walk through a couple of pieces. So when uh, you land on the site, the first thing you get is a uh, modal pop-up to show you some information about the project. Um, so you can read here a little bit more information, data policy, um, and some general guidelines for using the, the work. Um, if you click on the Getting Started tab, and I think this will be good to keep in your back pocket, is there's a tutorial that will actually walk you through all the different pieces of the um, portal. So if you click Start the Tutorial, you actually get a walkthrough of how each of the pieces work. Um, so that's a very useful way to kind of refresh yourself if you can't remember how something works. Um, we also provide a general overview of methods, including caveats about how to use the data. Um, and we also provide a link to a technical document here that describes in very great detail, hopefully, uh, how the, the atlas was constructed. Um, this is a report that was put up. So this just includes all the scripts that were run, uh, all the standardization of the historical data. So it uh, should be completely repeatable. Uh, there's some frequently asked questions that you can explore, uh, contact information and our data policy for the use of the data. Um, and it's important to note that there are known issues that can't be resolved because they're related to the collectors who collected the data back in the day. Um, so the data is made available as is. There's no warranty of accuracy from us. Um, we're just providing as much information with as much context as possible. So this modal pops up the first time you visit it. If you don't want to see it each time, you can click that button there and click done. Um, and this is the Forest, Heat, Forest Health Atlas. So there are um, three uh, sections, there's three, there's two main parts of the atlas that allow you to interact with information. The first is up here in the top right corner. This gives you access to um, all the different ways that data can be displayed in map form and table form and in graph form. You also get this uh, information button. If you click this, it pulls up the original pop-up. This is the download button and this is a share button. On the right hand side are three sets of uh, three sections. The first is called filters where you can really start to drill down on the data shown on the left here. And then there's pre-made maps, which I'll go into in a little bit later and map options. So uh, you can quickly get down to what it is you wanna see. So for example, um, if I'm interested in forest tank caterpillars, type, start typing forest 
and I get that uh, option right there. You can see in general any word match will show. So you can type moth and see all the moths that are in there. If you're a person who knows your codes and you know you, what you want, you can type it in by code too. These are related to the aerial detection survey standard codes. Um, so you can quickly get a, a list of what's in there and only damage agents that have been mapped are shown in this list. It's not the full set of codes. So I can add forest tent caterpillar. I could keep adding other agents, but I'm gonna just leave that one as is. Um, the next thing I want to do is I like, can also limit by year. So I could be interested only in stuff that's happened since 1980. Um, I could limit it by the damage type if I wanted to. I could also limit it by state. So I could say I just want to see data from one of these five states. Once I've made a change to any of these filters, this update map button down here becomes active. And when I click it, it will uh, redraw the map just showing the things that match my criteria. So this is all forest tent caterpillar damage that's been mapped digitally since 1980. Um, and which is great. And another thing I could do is say, okay, well now I'm really interested in the damage type. So I'm only going to look at mortality polygons and update the map again. And it draws it um, showing me that there's well, some of these polygons are mortality. You'll notice if you if your eyes are really good, you'll see that there's a couple of specs down here. Um, that's the way the features are pretty small in some cases. So we built a little uh, flash function that if you click the show features, it uh, lights them up a little bit and then goes back to normal. So you can at least see if there's some really small polygons where they might be on the landscape. So that's one kind of trick to get uh, be able to find some of these little pockets down here that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise in a uh, Eastern Massachusetts. So now uh, let's say I'm going to switch back in here and go instead to defoliation and update my map again. Um, so this shows me all defoliation happening from forest tent caterpillar. Uh, and another thing that's nice about the atlas is that I can start to add additional agents. So I could also put on gypsy moth, for example, and update my map again. And so now I'll get to see all gypsy moth and forest tent caterpillar defoliation since 1980. And that's where you can start to see these overlapping um, effects. So I can zoom in on an area down here and see these overlapping polygons and understand that there's kind of this co-location of uh, damages. I can click on individual polygons and get information about them. If there's multiples, I can click through these different tabs and it'll highlight those areas. So I can see what the agent was, what the damage type was, when it was reported, and the total acreage. And it does this for each of the uh, polygons. So uh, that's a way to kind of pull up some uh, information on these areas. And um, other thing that I can do is change the legend so that I can see the damage agent separately. So here on the map options, one of the things you can do is change the legend. So I could switch to damage agents and it'll draw it into slightly similar colors, dark blue for forest tent and purple for gypsy moth. But it allows you to see kind of the different types of agents that are showing up. Um, I can switch back to number of years damage as a default. So in addition to the mapped information, we also provide uh, tables of that same information. So here you can see the total area damaged in per year. Um, you can also look at it by agent or by type. In this case, we only show in defoliation and uh, frequency and extent. So this gives you kind of different breakdowns. You can download any one of these tables as a CSV or an Excel file or a PDF, um, if, whichever might be most useful. We can also look at the graph format of this. So this just shows by year how much is being damaged by these two agents. Um, you can look at the area by different agents. They're roughly similar. We can look at the area by type. Again, we only have one. Or we can look at it by frequency and extent. So this shows you how many times forest tent caterpillar has been mapped. Uh, we see 19 years of map damage from that. And um, the maximum area of extent is the, uh, the axis on the Y axis. Um, so it shows you how much uh, has been damaged in any one year or one event. And then the size of the circle corresponds to how much uh, Q 
cumulative damage has been done by that pest. So you can see Gypsy Moth in scale is a lot smaller. Um, it's had a lot more years of damage, 32 years, but its maximum event is much smaller, only 89,000 acres. And total area damage is likewise much smaller than forest tent. So we can kind of compare different uh, agents along this uh, graph. And finally, you can download the underlying data. Um, so you can click on the download link. You can download matching research data. You can download aerial detection survey data. Um, and if you click on this, uh, the nice thing is you can download the whole data set. So that's everything, not just what's shown on the graph, or you can download it customized to your current filter. So you could actually download just forest tent and gypsy moth data from 1980 forward. Um, and you can download that as a CSV just a comma separated value, kind of an Excel format. You can download it as a shapefile, KML, or GeoJSON. Um, likewise, you can download some, other, some of the other underlying spatial data sets, the research data points that are shown on the map uh, when the filters are cleared. So if I want to get back to the original space, I can just click Clear Filters. And you can download uh, all the spatial data related to those research plots, as well as the underlying spatial data. Another um, feature of this, I'm gonna switch back over to a clean tab, is I can um, actually share this map really easily as well. So if I say, wanna just look at Gypsy Moth, and I'm interested in, say, uh, just defoliation, and I can update that map. And if I wanna share this, I can click this and copy this link in and it will create the exact same view. So if I paste that into my browser here, I get brought back to the same exact map state. So it's really easy to share a map that you've created here um, to, with other people uh, using this link. So that's one other option that you can use for um, sharing information that you develop out of the Atlas. Finally, around uh, showing information on the aerial detection survey, we also assembled uh, a couple of um, hotspot analyses for certain pest and damage types. Um, so if we look at, say, uh, gypsy moth, all damage occurrences, um, we looked, we stacked all the polygons and identified areas where there had been multiple um, disturbances over time. So you can see in this graphic, for example, all the gypsy moth, damage, gypsy moth damage that's been mapped, and you can start to pick out quick, pretty quickly hot spots of damage areas that have been repeatedly damaged over time. And each of these layers is downloadable as a, uh, as a shape file or CSV, so you can download those all from here in this pre-made map download selection option. And finally, the other piece uh, was the research data that I mentioned. So we, looking at the NSRC data, there's a lot of information on pollution impacts on forests, um, given the historical context of the northern forest. Um, there are some data research studies that have been conducted around pests that have field data. Um, so one just to show an example of how this can work is if I were to look for winter injury uh, types of damage and update that, I not only get the polygons that have been mapped over time, but here's a study that's been done to look at winter injury. Um, and you can see that under research sites here, I have uh, one study out of 14 that matched my filters. So I click show my research projects and scroll down. I can see this little uh, box here that shows me I have some research projects matching my filters this winter injury, carbon loss, and surprising growth resurgence in red spruce. Clicking on this, um, I get information on the project, who, who conducted it, the damage agents and types, the years, number of data sets, and I can click on a link to view it in the FEMC archive. So here's how we link that, mon that research data in. People can get a lot more information about the project. They can view the list of the available data sets. Um, so here's one on uh, basal area increment for trees, um, and it gives you a lot of detailed metadata plus access to download that data if you're so interested. So all of these uh, research projects are here. Um, you can quickly browse other ones, even if they didn't match. You can see some of the NSRC funded projects. Clicking on them will give you additional information about that project. You can also click on the, poly the uh, points themselves. And if you scroll down, there's a link to 
jump to the FEMC archive. So that's the way that we've made research data accessible through this portal as well. Um, at the map options, you can switch between satellite and street map. You can adjust the transparency. So if you're really zoomed in and you want to see what the underlying um, features are, you can adjust the transparency, the layers, so you can look at the satellite layers underneath it. Um, and those are the major features of the Forest Health Atlas. And I wanted to take one more minute to uh, talk about some great work that's been done by Ali Kasiva and others on the team to do some analysis of the more recent era of data. Um, so just to coach show that this uh, compilation also can have some uh, a utility for doing some research and analysis on what's happening over time. Uh, based on this study, they found we found that 10% of the region has experienced at least one uh, type of damage and 3% of the forested area in the region has experienced more than one type of damage over the 16 year period. And much of that damage comes from pests and diseases. Uh, the, major, the vast majority comes from insects. And it's also pretty interesting to note that more than 50% of the damage has been, of insect damage has been caused by uh, non-native invasive insects. And that represents only 17 agents in total causing that uh, disproportionate amount of damage. So I think it really shows kind of one of the main dynamics happening in our forests today. And uh, we've also been able to look at some of these uh, extent versus uh, timing or episodic uh, events using some uh, graphical displays, you can start to see events that are fairly minor. So on the x-axis is the number of years that that agent was detected. On the y-axis is the maximum single extent of any one damaged year. And then the size of the circle is the total area in millions of hectares mapped over the period of, the stu of this uh, study. So you can see these minor disturbances in the bottom left. Uh, we have episodic disturbances, so ones that don't happen every year, but when they do happen, they have large maximum extents. And then we have our chronic ongoing stressors, um, some of the ones that we're most familiar with because they happen regularly and they disturb in total large amounts of area, and in some cases have large outbreaks. Um, and I think luckily for Northeastern forests, we don't see a lot of chronic and high damage episodes, but that's uh, something that could change. So this paper has a lot more information in it, but I just wanted to give a quick um, plug for that. And uh, looking forward, uh, we at FEMC are committed to keeping this data updated. We'll be adding new to IDS data as it becomes available. We just got the 2017 data a couple weeks ago, so we're still, we're gonna put that in soon. We'll also expand the research data sets uh, and then, Forest Health Atlas by uh, continuing to contact uh, past NSRC funded researchers, but also bringing in other research projects in the FEMC archive um, and upping that number quite substantially in the next month or so. And finally, expanding the utility by adding needed features. So if there's additional things that you think we need to be making available on this portal or providing other tools to access this information, we're interested in hearing about that so we can try and continue to improve this resource as we maintain it. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, just a quick note that coming up on, on October 9th, we have another webinar on another FEMC tool for the Northeast Forest Fragmentation Information Network, which we'll be announcing and releasing soon, as well as our December 14th annual conference. This year we're focusing on forests and climate change. Uh, we're opening up abstract submissions in the next day. Uh, so if you're interested in submitting a talk or in attending, it should be a pretty interesting day so far. And with that, I'm gonna look at the question box and see if anyone's posted some questions. So I don't see any. So if you do have a question, please uh, put it in the uh, question box. And I see one question in the chat that says, what's the simplest way to get started for a newcomer? Um, and that would de definitely be uh, heading over back to this info tab and clicking on it and going through the getting started routine. You can start that tutorial and it'll walk you through all those features. And really, I think it's just clicking in any one of these boxes and starting to uh, limit down what you're interested in. Um, so there's a lot of information here, but just starting with a little bit of filtering and a little bit of clicking to see what it gets you can really give you a pretty um, quick idea of what's available and what you can do with this atlas. Let's put this back to street map. Um, are there any, 
There's another question. So Garrett is asking, would it be possible to look at climate change or climate effects on these forest health patterns? So the answer is absolutely. Um, I think the nice thing that we have from this resource is a temporal record that's standardized and already assembled. So if that can be looked at in terms of past climate effects and the or past climate patterns and what trends we saw, that can certainly be looked at. There's been discussion of using some uh, Bayesian modeling to look at historical patterns in a number of different environmental factors, including climate and seeing if that explains any of the variability we see in the location, timing, and extent of different types of agents. So we can certainly use this, this data set to kind of inform those studies. And as we get better information on growing degree days in the past and changes expected in the future, we could also look at how those could affect certain pest emergence um, or shifts northward in different species distributions. Thanks for that. Does anyone else have a question about the Forest Health Atlas or anything else that you'd like to be able to do with it? Great. Well, um, if you are interested in looking at this again, there will be, uh, this is going to be um, available to watch. This has been recorded so you can watch it back online at the same link that you used to access the, the registration. So feel free to check that out. And if you have any uh, suggestions on uh, ways that we can improve this or other things that we can do, here's some email addresses uh, that you can contact. Um, I'm at the top. You can also just write femc at uvm.edu and we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for taking a half hour with us and I look forward to uh, hearing what you think. Thanks so much. Bye.